Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us for this virtual development summit, developer summit, not a development summit, but you can do a lot of development too. This session is ArcGIS Notebook Server, an introduction to notebooks and the notebook server. I'm Shannon Kaliski. I'm the lead product manager for analytics and data science, and ArcGIS Notebooks is one of the products that I have the privilege to cover. One of my favorites, I will say. And joining me today is... Hi, I'm Bill Major, and I am the, one of the lead developers for Notebook Server. All right. Let's jump right into it. What is ArcGIS Notebooks? Essentially, what it is is an integrated Jupyter Notebook experience that's been optimized for spatial analysis, meaning that we've made it easier for you to access ArcGIS spatial algorithms, data that you have within your organization, and data that lives within the ArcGIS community, whether that's from users within ArcGIS Online or from the Living Atlas. You can reduce time spent managing dependencies when you're working with ArcGIS Notebooks because within the notebook experience, all of the dependencies are managed by what's called a notebook runtime. We'll elaborate more on what that means a little later. You can increase cross-team collaboration because your notebooks are stored as items in your portal. And because we, you're using the notebook runtime, it means you don't have to worry if you have the right libraries and right versions and right environment to be able to run someone's notebook. You can just open it in your portal and be good to go. And because it's built on Jupyter, you can take advantage of all of the flexibility and interactivity that the notebook itself gives you, as well as the markdown cells. So if you want to include an image, a GIF, a video, an ArcGIS application, like a dashboard or a story map. I've even seen people in, add entire hub sites directly in their notebook to show where the data is coming from. You can do all of that. The three key areas that we've seen notebooks be used for is WebGIS administration, so automating how you manage your users, um, your items, that sort of thing, content management, and analysis and data science. So the notebook itself sits at the intersection of ArcGIS and all the goodness we offer from the Python API, ArcPy, and all of our analytical engines and open source. We wanted a way for these two worlds to come together and give you the ability to make them use the best of both. Now, if you're wondering why are there asterisks there with GeoAnalytics and Raster Analytics, that is only there to say that you need to actually have those servers federated with your enterprise deployment if you want to see those tools um, actually appear so you can use them. And the notebook experience sits right there in that intersection. So how is this different than a traditional Jupyter Notebook? Well, first, it's actually built into ArcGIS rather than sitting beside it. For the last couple of years, we have shipped ArcGIS Note, uh, not ArcGIS Notebooks, we've shipped Jupyter alongside ArcGIS Pro. So you had the ability to just go to the Python command prompt and be able to kick that off and start working with it. But if you're like me and many other Python developers, you have more than your fair share of Python environments on your machine you probably haven't kept up with every single one of them. And sometimes going back and finding which one actually held that notebook you were after can be uh, a little bit of an adventure. Now with notebooks built in, you can easily find them. You can share them with groups. If you're using notebooks in Pro, they're stored directly in your Pro project. If you're using notebooks in Enterprise or online, they're stored within your organization, just like any other item. They leverage an integrated user experience. So in the hosted space, you see the ability to automatically insert Python snippets when you're adding analysis tools or when you're looking for data, as well as giving you a quick access to a gallery of samples. It's just built in right there. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in just a second. Notebooks are saved as items. This means that you can apply the same security and governance that you do to your applications and your data to your notebooks as well. It gives you the ability to use ArcPy without having to check out ArcGIS Pro. Now, this isn't to say you should not use Pro at all. There are many ex like great value that ArcGIS Pro provides you. It's a very powerful data science workstation. And now with notebooks built into it, it's even more powerful and flexible. But what this is getting at is there have been requests that we've received from our users asking for the ability to use geoprocessing tools within ArcGIS Online, but not having to set up an entire enterprise deployment to be able to call that service from. 
So using notebooks, you will have that ability to use ArcPy within the hosted ArcGIS Online organization and be able to run those geoprocessing tools and build models based on them. So that is now an option for you. And using that notebook runtime concept, you can centrally manage those libraries and packages. So you don't have to worry about everybody having their own unique implementations. But that said, if you're a data scientist and you're thinking, oh man, my organization is not going to give me any of the libraries that I need. Well, first, we include over 300 open source libraries out of the box. Probably a lot of the things that immediately come to your mind, they're already there. But on top of that, if there was something that you wanted that wasn't there, you can still do in notebook pip and conda installs to be able to access that. And when you're using ArcGIS Enterprise, your organization can even create a custom notebook runtime so that you can easily access and share that across others in your organization. Then there's the sample notebook. So I just mentioned this briefly, but here's what they are. They're end-to-end -end workflows for WebGIS administration, content management, and data science and analysis, those kind of three pillars of the notebook. Samples can be used to learn something new or to jumpstart your own analysis. So you can go and just use them as a tutorial, or you can use them to go ahead and steal some code from. Um, you can take a notebook and just swap out the data that we used with data that you are curious to see that analysis run on. It's really up to you. And some of these samples are completely ready to run, meaning that you could open them up and in theory just go to run all cells and have it run everything through. Now, if you do that and don't read them, you're not going to learn a whole bunch from it, but you could do it. Um, but other notebooks do require you to configure some parameters for them to be able to run. This is especially true of ones where you're managing content or uh, doing some administrative work because this wants to know about your unique situation. What is that content? What is that group you're looking for? That sort of thing. But I think the best way to learn about ArcGIS Notebooks is just to see it. So I'm going to show you the hosted experience of ArcGIS Notebooks. I'm going to use ArcGIS Enterprise for that. And I'm going to show you a look at notebooks within ArcGIS Pro. So let's hop over to our enterprise deployment. So this is a 10.8 ArcGIS Enterprise deployment. This is just what my home page looks like, yours will look like, whatever your organization has configured it to look like. You know you have notebook privileges when in the top navigation you see the notebook option. So this means that administrators will see it and those who have been granted a custom role that has notebook privileges assigned. When I click on this, it will open up a uh, ArcGIS notebook for me. We kick you off with a couple of cells of Markdown to be able to get you started. Running this first cell connects me to my deployment as myself, meaning that I don't have to enter my credentials in plain text. This really increases the shareability of my notebooks because I'm not asking for someone to enter their credentials or create a profile or do anything else. The notebook handles all of that for you with that GIS equals GIS home. Now, if I want to start analysis, one of the first places I'll go look is for data. So here I can search data from my content, my organization, the Living Atlas, and ArcGIS Online. We'll go to my organization, and I'll search from some data from the DC area. So here I have some restaurants. By default, every Python snippet that we add in for data calls the whatever your content is item. So I'll just change that to something meaningful to me. This is restaurant data, so I'll give it the name of R. Um, another thing you'll see that we've done is we've added comments that tell you what the name of the layer is, what type it is, and who owns it. Because others in your organization may be the owners of this content and may not realize that you're using it, it's possible that they delete it and all of a sudden your notebook stops working. By having this comment in the cells, it lets you know that who is the person you can go find to find the layer that you need. So from here, I could go and I could start exploring this uh, data so on a map. So let's do that. This is in Washington, DC. So I'm just going to tell it I want to go to Washington. We'll add that layer and draw it on the map. So in just a second, this will draw a map of Washington, DC. And while that does it, I'm going to import some modules that I need. Oops. Oh, typo. There we go. 
all right, so while I was adding those modules, the map drew in. We have now an interactive uh, map of all of these points that I can click on. I can get all the pop-up information, but that would be very tedious for me to go through all, I don't even know how many points are there. Um, so an easier way would be for me to go ahead and explore this in a data frame. So we're gonna do that. So I'm going to first just call the specific layer that I need. And now I'm gonna create the data frame. And we'll just call the first five rows. From layer PD. Uh, there we go. There we go. Um, okay, so now we have our spatial data frame in here where we can see all of the attributes about this uh, restaurant data. We see that we have a field called sales volume. So maybe we want to understand where are the statistically significant clusters of high sales volume restaurants. And so, just like we were able to go and add our data, we can also add analysis tools. So to solve that problem, I would use a Find Hotspots tool. So this is added to my notebook as an automatic snippet. What I can do, because I probably haven't memorized the entire Python API, is use the Jupyter shortcut of erasing those parentheses, replace them with a question mark. It'll give me the full signature, as well as descriptions about each of the parameters that I need to fill out. So let's go put our parentheses back in and start filling this out using autocomplete. So we'll do an analysis layer of our feature layer, analysis field. We wanted to understand that sales volume. So let's do that. And we'll give it an output name. And HS just for hotspot. All right, so we'll let that run and quickly make another map. Let's see if I can beat the API. I type fast, but this API is also... Oh, I think I'm gonna do it. Oh, I did it. Yes, okay, so I actually have a little bit of slow Wi-Fi right now, so that's probably why I was able to do it. On fast Wi-Fi, I cannot beat it. But while that's running, let's go ahead and take a look at a few other features. See, there it goes. Um, you can see that drew in with the smart mapping renderer. We can see where the statistically significant clusters of high sales volume restaurants are. All right, but back to this files. Files is your own personal workspace within ArcGIS notebooks where you can go and you can, first of all, delete anything you already have uploaded, but you can also upload new files. So if I wanted to go and search for some data that I might have, I could go look for that. So maybe I have some some documents that I want to add or anything else, I could go find those and put them in here. I don't have anything that I actually want to add. I have all my data there. Um, you can even add this to your notebook as an automatic snippet. So I hit that. You can see it already inserted that path for me. So that's an option too. To save this notebook, um, I have a save button over here, but first let's rename it because untitled notebook eight is not helpful for people. No, that's no good? No. In fact, mm. at 1081, we have changed this behavior so that way um, if you are creating a notebook, we will not automatically persist an untitled notebook. You have to explicitly save it and give it a name. If you choose to name it untitled notebook, that's up to you. You can, If you're really feeling nostalgic for that, you can do that. Um, and Maybe we'll give them a little sneak preview at that at the oh, end. Oh, yeah, that sounds great. <laughs> well, let's do that. All right, so now that I have a meaningful name, let's go ahead and share it. I think the world needs to see this great notebook, so I'll share it with everyone and say OK. To preview the samples, I can click this Samples button right here. I actually see that I already have it open. And here you can see all of the samples that we have available. These samples can walk you through everything from site selection to spatial machine learning to prepping data for deep learning to doing content management and administrative work. There's lots of samples for you to explore. But before I jump back into slides, let's take a look at the local implementation of ArcGIS Notebook. So here I have a pro project. This is Pro25. I've brought in, I've created an ArcGIS Notebook. I've just imported some modules. I created a spatial data frame. And let's just pull in some analysis. So um, I could just write this from scratch, 
but I have my geoprocessing history. I can just copy the Python command there and paste it. So you can see it's inserted everything there. Maybe I want to give it another output name there. And let's run that cell. So that put in all of the parameters I need. And you see, as soon as it finished, it drew it on the map and added it to my pro table of content. So I have a great uh, interactivity between the map, the notebook, and everything else. If you're wondering, how did you get this notebook? Um, there's a new notebook option at the top. So um, if I click into map, you'll see what it looks like when you don't have any notebook. If you go to insert, you'll see new notebook. If you're already on a notebook tab, it'll look like this and you'll have the option for a new notebook. You also can do it from your catalog pane. So you just browse to your folder and um, you can add a new notebook there as well. So that's just a little sneak peek of that. There's a great video of Ankita showing a demo of Notebooks in Pro. Um, we're focused today on Notebooks in Enterprise, but I did want to go ahead and give you that sneak peek. Let's jump back into the slides and do a little recap of what we just saw. Okay, so you saw the integrated interface to browse for analysis tool, find data, insert automatic Python snippets, you saw that I had access to the content in my organization. While I didn't go into it, you can also go into Living Atlas and ArcGIS Online. You can create and run scripts with ArcPy. Um, I showed that in the pro notebooks, but you can also do it in the hosted notebooks in online and enterprise. And there's many samples that walk you through that. We saw the private workspace where I could store data, interim results. Actually, if you're working with ArcPy within ArcGIS notebooks, you should, and you'll need to, use your files location to create your file geo database where you're going to be creating and storing those feature classes. Then you can use the Python API if you need to persist those out as layers in your portal. Um, it's also a great place for scratch environments when you're working with ArcPy. Um, Python libraries and packages can be synchronized across the organization, but you can still modify what comes out of the box using pip and conda installs. Notebooks are saved as items. This is a new item type called a notebook. You have read-only previews, so if you share a notebook with someone who does not have notebook privileges, what it does is it allows them to view the notebook but in read-only mode. So that way you can share the work without worrying that anyone is going to go and tamper with your code. But even if you did share a notebook to someone that does have notebook privileges, they are only ever editing a copy of your notebook. And this will continue to be the behavior until we add in um, versioning and may even continue after that. But essentially, you don't want to have any possibility that someone is somewhere in the world deleting your code while you are trying to run it. So that is why we allow people to edit copies of your notebook, not your original. You also have secure identity-based access. Basically, you need to have privileges and you must be a member of the portal. The minimum user type requirement is a creator or higher, meaning a creator or any of the GIS professional user types. And we also explored some of the sample notebook gallery. But with that, I'm going to turn it over to Bill Major so we can walk through some deployment and setup. OK. Thank you, Shannon. That was awesome. Is it Shannon, is it Shannon awesome, everybody? <laughs> I'll give her a big hand. <laughs> Have to recreate the uh, the, the live the experience. Tech, yeah, the tech, the live workshop mm -hmm. experience. All right, Shannon has shown you all of the great cool stuff. I unfortunately have to walk through all the mundane uh, back end sysadmin. This stuff. is the important so stuff, though. This it's... is the important stuff, but it's uh, um, this is where the the system administrator aspect. But I'm going to show you some cool things today, and and hopefully um, get get through um, some important uh, key concepts. So the first thing let's talk about is we're going to focus on um, ArcGIS Enterprise. Is what are the system requirements for deploying a notebook server? Well, we if you read our documentation, you will see that we support both Windows and Linux uh, installations. But notice there's this big glowing uh, box around the Linux ins uh, installation. Um, for Windows, we really only support that in what we're calling a, a let's just say, a development environment. There are some limitations that exist with Docker running our Linux containers that makes it a challenge um, to run in production environments. 
So uh, we really want to stress that um, if you're going to run Notebook Server in production and want to be able to scale it out in a very successful manner, really need to go uh, go down the Linux path. Um, so so just want to you know strongly urge that. Um, with either installation, there is a Docker prerequisite. So you might have heard Shannon say that a container is spun up when you launch a new notebook. So we're, we're using Docker containers um, for that purpose. It helps create that sandbox isolated environment so users can't clobber each other or perhaps do bad things to the host system. Um, so that is a, a requirement that needs to be installed before notebook server. We have good doc on that of, of how to get that accomplished. We have some very minimal hardware requirements. Um, you know, we're probably going to strongly urge um, more RAM um, um, than what's listed here, but these are minimal system requirements, of course. Operating systems, you know, we um, from a uh, from a Linux side, we support Red Hat um, and Ubuntu, and of course with Docker on on Windows, uh, you know, th that's what's listed there. You may be looking at this, um, probably someone may be a huge Internet Explorer shop. You don't see Internet Explorer listed here as a browser. And that's because uh, Jupyter Notebooks uh, itself don't really support Internet Explorer. So um, that's why why we don't list it either. So um, those are the sophisticated. And before you move on from that, Bill, yeah. if, if anyone's watching and thinking, oh my gosh, we have to move to a Linux shop, we are a Windows shop, mm. you can we support split deployments, meaning all of your ArcGIS Enterprise can be in Windows and you only put your notebook server in Linux. That is fully supported. It's been added to our documentation. Right. Our support teams are well aware of this, so don't panic. You don't have to move everything to Linux. It's just this one, and we do strongly recommend using Linux. Yeah, and also even to uh, detail that a little bit, um, we even have some customers that are running their web adapter on Windows for Notebook Server, and the only thing on Linux is just the Notebook Server. So you can even have a mixed uh, web adapter to Notebook Server uh, mixed environment as well. Good point. Thank you. Um, so this is just a conceptual diagram of what Notebook Server is like. Um, so you have a base deployment um, that could reside all on one machine, but in a production environment so that typically is a distributed environment. Uh, with Notebook Server, it's much like any of our other server products. It's a separate install. Um, you will install it. You'll license it. Um, you'll configure the web adapter with it. And then you will federate it to portal, much like any other uh, server role. And we're going to take a look at that. And then as users are opening notebooks um, as part of this environment, each user gets their own Docker container. So there's no sharing of containers between users. Um, each user is isolated to uh, their Docker container in which, you know, notebooks get opened. So that's, that's kind of how things work. So let's talk about a little bit of uh, history. Um, notebook server is not very old. At 10.7, we, when we first released it, it only supported a single machine site. So if you're trying to install 10.7 and thinking about uh, scalability or HA at this point, um, you need to be thinking at 10.71 or higher at this point. 10.8 um, has just been released, by the way, right? Mm -hmm. Just a couple, two or three weeks ago. So 10.8 is there now. Um, but 10.71 supports multi machine sites. Um, so that's really good. It allows you to you know, start scaling out your site to support you know, user demands. And when it comes to HA, of course, we do support that now as well. Um, we've been testing some things in, in AWS as well as on-premise that allows for, you know, multiple web adapters, multi-node sites, so you can achieve a full failover situation as well. Um, one thing, um, I just want to make note here, let me back up one. Um, for some of the folks that may be down at a, you know, technical level, um, Notebooks uses WebSockets. So that's kind of a new, uh, new protocol through the ArcGIS Enterprise stack from the web adapter all the way through notebook server to the back end Docker containers. So, um, so when we, that's one of the reasons we have this point here that notebooks are stateful. We need to maintain a persistent connection you know, from the client browser all the way to their specific container and it's done using WebSockets. We've changed their web adapter to be able to support WebSockets. And so um, I just want to make that note because that is a um, you know, something new within our platform that we now support um, that, you know, just should be made aware of. Yeah. All right. 
So that's a little bit about installing Notebook Server, you know, a little bit about um, some basic system requirements and things like that. Um, we'll take a look at something in a mo moment, but the next thing we're going to talk about are what we call notebook runtimes. Shannon mentioned that you know, we had these notebooks and they have 300 libraries in them, which is really cool. We refer to these um, container states or these sets of libraries as notebook runtimes. And the reason we refer to that is you know, over time, um, the Conda environment um, may change or may get upgraded or may have new libraries added to it. So we want to maintain this concept of a notebook runtime run at a specific version. So if a notebook is ever opened in the future, um, you'll be assured that as long as the notebook runtime that it was created with is still present, that it will run, that it won't break because you know, there are package updates or things like that. So um, as you start to dig around the doc and we'll take a look at the admin API, that's what this notebook runtime concept is. We ship two notebook runtimes with every release. There's a standard and an advanced. Standard basically has everything in it from the, the ArcGIS API for Python to all of these really great open source libraries. The advanced container contains everything standard does plus the ArcPy. So that's the real key difference. And the ArcPy brings in a handful of other uh, kind of packages as well, but you know it's, it's dependencies that it needs. So, um, you know, notebook runtimes with each release, we, we deploy two. As you upgrade, we don't delete the old notebook runtime. So over time, if you upgrade from 10.7 to 10.7.1 to 10.8, you'll see that you'll have, you know, notebook runtimes maintained. And that's because um, we don't want to delete any runtimes that would then potentially break any notebooks that were written to rely on certain versions of Python libraries. Is that good, Shannon? Mm -hmm. Did I miss yeah. anything there? If, and if anyone's worried about, well, will they ever be deleted, the plan is that they will follow the software lifecycle of ArcGIS Enterprise. And if we are going to deprecate one, don't worry. It will follow our normal deprecation announcement. So you will have many years to move from one notebook <laughs> runtime to the other. But any new notebook you do open, once there is, um, say, you upgrade and mm -hmm. now there's a new runtime available, those will automatically use the newest runtimes. Yep. So this is a very um, popular question that many, or you know, many enterprise admins always want to ask: is how do we plan for capacity? How big does my server have to be? Kind of thing. Um, so let's just talk about this a little bit. Um, so by default, and these are all configurable settings, which we'll look at in the admin API. Any user that launches a notebook, therefore a Docker container, using the standard runtime will be given a up to a maximum uh, utilization of one CPU and four gigs of RAM. Does that mean the Docker container automatically consumes that much off the host system when it starts? The answer is no. But this is a maximum that they will only be able to use. So if they start doing really heavy duty things within the container itself or within the notebook itself, then you know the potential could exist where they hit that limit and then Docker will start to um, do kind of bad things and basically you know, not let the user go over that amount. This is a configurable setting, of course. And for users of the advanced runtime, we set that default to two cores and six gig gigabytes of RAM. Typically, people that are going to use ArcPy are doing more advanced analysis using some of the spatial stats tools, perhaps, or something like that, which typically do need more, more memories for some of those operations. Okay? So, you know, if you're saying, well, do, you know, does that mean I need, you know, if I'm going to support 20 standard users, does that mean I need an 80 gig system? Not necessarily right off the bat. That just means that if every user were to max out their container, uh, max, you know, resource allocation or their max resource allocation, you know, you would need, you, you would need to think about things like that. But um, it's a balance between what your users are doing in their notebooks and um, you know, how, deciding how much RAM that you really need to support those, those number of users. All right, so just talk briefly about one thing I want to highlight here is uh, recently delivered with 10.8 and at 10.7 and 10.7.1, we didn't have a manager app for notebook server. Well, we have that now, and it's actually a portal app. Uh, many of you may be familiar with uh, Server Manager, which is a, a JavaScript app that comes um, deployed inside of ArcGIS Server. But this is an app that actually comes in Portal. Um, it's got a very new, you know, clean look, and it's really, you know, integrated with the Portal UI. 
And once you install Notebook Server, then you um, admins will have access to, uh, to be able to open this app. And we'll take a look at that as well. And another exciting thing um, at 10.8 was the new ability to what we call execute notebook. What that really means is being able to automatically run an entire notebook with no user interaction, um, or you know, maybe you want to call it headless. So once you've created a notebook and you know it's set up to run automatically, like uh, Shannon showed, if you could open this notebook and say run all cells and it would just run without no user interaction, then you can actually um, you know, use this to, uh, as part of an execute notebook call that will you know, basically run this automatically for you. And we also support passing in parameters that get injected inside the notebook that can then be used as variables or, or you know, to be accessed in some manner. So we'll take a look at all this here in just a minute. So I think the best way for me to spend the rest of our time, Shannon, I'm not sure how we're doing on time, but is let's just go through some quick demos of looking at some things. And while Bill's bringing that up, for anyone wondering, how do I know if my notebook's ready for scheduling or for, for the execute notebook? I would say set it up to where you think it's good and do a run all at mm -hmm. least twice. Because <laughs> if you do it once, you might have set it up just fine for that one time, but the next time we'll tell you, did you have any conflicts with o needing to overwrite things or add date timestamps, any of that? So yep. do it at least twice for simple notebooks. All right, so let's quickly move through some, um, some things here I want to cover. So if you've never dealt with ArcGIS uh, or with Notebook Server, you will federate that like any other server. So you'll have a public URL and an admin URL that you want to federate with. Notebook Server runs on a, a port 11443. The reason we're using a different port is so that if you really wanted to install it um, all on one machine with different uh, other pieces of our software, there won't be any port conflicts. conflicts. And then once you federate that notebook server, you can then designate that site as your notebook server site. So this is a 10.8 portal, I believe. And um, if you haven't seen this before, then you'll be able to designate your notebook server site. Now you as an admin, you do that. And as Shannon pointed out, you're gonna have this nice little notebook tab show up here at the top, but then you say, okay, users have at it. I did this um, as an IT admin. Um, you to I did what you told me to do, but then all your users are like, well, wh I don't have this notebook thing at the top. That is because being able to have notebooks uh, access is a, is a privilege, okay? It is not available at, to the default publisher or default user or anything like that. It is only available via a custom privilege if you are a non-admin, okay? So basically what you have to do is create a new role and then in that role, assign the role whatever other th you know capabilities or um, you know access points that you want for users, and then enable create and edit netbook. No oh, man, I'm having a hard time today. <laughs> create and edit notebooks. This is basically gives users the standard notebook capability, and then for any users that you want to be able to run the advanced notebooks, you need to click on the advanced notebooks. You can separate these into two separate roles, one for standard users, one for advanced users, um, which may be something you, you want to do as well. You can also use the advanced notebooks privilege to gate any of your custom runtimes that you add. Mm. So that would, be, yeah. that would be an option too. If you had something that you didn't want every notebook user to have, but just some, you could use that. And really common is people just want to add it to a publisher. So you can quickly just import the publisher role and then just check one yep. or both of those notebook privileges to um, get everything that people need. Yep. So let's go to the manager. So with this portal I've set up, so um, the link that gets put here actually gives you direct uh, link access to the notebook manager. As you can see, this is a portal app. You know, I'm still in my portal context. So this is a really nice, uh, very beautiful, I like to call it notebook manager. Um, the, the, the overview page has things like some basic site information, making sure that the, all the nodes, I only have one node in my site, um, are passing their health check. It gives you, I believe, the five most freq frequent warning or severe logs. Um, as you can see, um, I'm not sure what's going on here, but I got a few warning and log messages there, as well as a listing of all the machines and their physical characteristics. So a very nice overview page to give you a quick look at Hey, how's the health? What's the activity? How many containers are currently running? And some things like that. We can 
you know, dig a little bit deeper, you know, for this container, this one container that's running, it lists the username, its ID, which notebook runtime it's using. So here I'm using the, the advanced uh, runtime for this one. Its version, um, this version may not mean a lot to you, 3.0 or 4.0, but it's how we keep track of the different notebook runtimes as we release over time. So, um, so you'll see this number here, and that relates, relates to a specific note, notebook runtime version that we're maintaining internally. Uh, when it was contained, a uh, container was created. You also have the ability to reach inside the Docker container and retrieve logs from the it. So this has a, I'm in debug mode, so there's a whole lot of, um, a, whole lot of a whole lot of stuff going on right now. But um, this may be helpful sometimes in troubleshooting mode or something like that to be able to extract those logs and be able to see them easily. Um, as well as see, view some basic statistics. So this container is basically sitting here and not doing anything right now. You can see that this, because this is an advanced runtime, I've been allocated six gig, but it's only consuming this much off of the host system. So right now, you know, um, my container really isn't doing much and therefore isn't consuming much from the host system. As I mentioned, like that six gig is a maximum limit. Uh, limit. You won't see it go over that, but it doesn't automatically uh, request and consume six gig uh, when, it, when it starts. Logs, I'm not gonna spend much time here. This is much, much like any other of our apps, you know, just harvesting admin API logs um, if you wanted to request some of that. And then you can go look at some other basic settings. You know, I can, we can change the log level here, of course. Uh, so we can change some settings. So by default, um, there, each node can only run 20 containers. Um, that's just a, you know, sort of a, I wouldn't say arbitrary, you know, we've done a lot of testing in this area, but for any, like an average server, you know, 20 nodes, you may need to, you may want to adjust this either up or down, depending on how big your servers are and, and, and the RAM settings. Um, so containers and notebooks will clean themselves up over time. So if you do a whole bunch of work, then go on vacation for a week, it's not going to continue to consume those resources over time. You know, if a notebook's been idle for 24 hours, it will destroy itself. And then eventually if there are no more notebooks open a container and it's been sitting idle for more than 60 minutes with no open notebooks, then the container will go away as well. And remember destroying itself just means it will close and you have whatever the last saved state was. So if you didn't save anything, then you have an empty notebook. If you saved something, then it'll just revert to that state. Your in-memory values right. will be lost. Right. The WebSocket size, I'm not going to spend much time on, but it is important. Um, this is, so WebSockets is, like I mentioned, the persistent channel that data passes back and forth between the web browser and the backend Jupyter Notebook. If you start doing some really heavy data lifting with like pandas or using um, some local data sets that Shannon showed that you might have uploaded to your file, to your home, your private workspace location, um, we, this could become constrained and there are certain error messages that will present itself when this is a problem. So there are situations where you may need to up this size. Um, but yeah, just, yeah, just make that point as well. Um, where's your configuration store located? Um, these are all kind of basic, typical, you know, server types of things. Where are your system directories located? And here are your notebook runtimes. So we have a standard and advanced. And you also you notice that I have a what I call what we call custom runtimes. And I'm going to show you that hopefully if we have time to quickly show you how you can create your own custom notebook runtime. So if there's a set of open source or set of Python libraries that you want every user to have um, in, a, in a notebook runtime, we have a workflow for that and we'll be sure to uh, w work through that real quick. So, um, so we also have an admin API, which is driving our manager app. I'm not going to spend a lot of time here. This looks very much like our ArcGIS server admin APIs or our portal admin APIs. Do know that, of course, the, the manager app is you know, calling this. Um, the things that are kind of specific to notebook server is system containers. So this is where your containers show up. Of course, this is the same information being presented here in, in the manager app. Um, so that's kind of specific to notebook server. Um, config store, jobs, directories, these all are very typical of ArcGIS server as well. So I'm not going to go into that in detail. But then here at the main page, you see notebooks. 
So Notebooks has um, some APIs here. As Notebooks are open, they show up here. Um, anytime you open a new notebook, like from right here, it's actually calling this Open Notebook API. Um, just be aware of that. This isn't typically something you would come to the API and, and use yourself. It's something that the, the manager app uh, specifically is wired to use. But then there's also this execute notebook, which we'll um, talk about um, a little bit more, is if you have a notebook item saved and the notebook can run automatically, then you can come here and fully run that notebook, um, but just by giving it an item ID. And I'm gonna show you how to call that from a Python script. So you could then start to automate execution of your notebooks um, 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 in various different ways. So, um, so that's what the execute notebook is about. Um, so Shannon, let's, so one of the big questions that people always ask is how do I, I have these notebook runtimes, but how do I create my own notebook runtime with some additional libraries into it? All right, so one of the things I wanna do very quickly or show you how I created this was, here's a notebook runtime, the standard one that's, advanced, that's shipped with 10.8, okay? Now, we have good doc on this, but it does allow you to get a little bit low level. So you may have to get at the command line a little bit on your notebook server. So one of the things we tell you to do is we're gonna, we ask you to create a new Docker file. So I'm just going to quickly show you a Docker file that I have created. Now, what does this Docker file do? This Docker file basically says, hey, from an existing, Im ugh, from an existing image, I then want to install additional Conda packages. Okay, this is what a typical Docker file looks like. You'll notice that the image ID here mimics the image ID of the standard runtime that is already registered with my notebook server, okay? So then once you have a Docker file set up like this, you issue a command, and I'm not gonna run it because it does take a few minutes. Uh, all right, I haven't run it, but you're gonna issue a Docker build command. So this Docker build command basically says, hey, run a Docker build process and use that Docker file. So it will build a brand new Docker image based on whatever this Docker file says. So it's gonna take whatever's in standard and then do additional things to it. So in this case, it added the additional um, libraries available, uh, that, this yellow brick, which I'll show here in just a minute. Now when that is done, and I know we're down in the weeds, but we have Doc on this, you'll notice that it builds a brand new Docker image on your system with a brand new Docker image ID. Okay, this is important. Okay, because now what we're gonna do is we're gonna go back to our notebook manager to settings, runtimes, and I'm going to register a new runtime. So in this case, we're gonna call it test, uh, we want to give it the same version as our software, in this case, 3.0. You decide what the max CPU setting here is. I'm going to say four, or no, one, since I'm building this on top of the standard container, but you could change it to whatever you want. You can decide if this needs advanced privileges or not. Do you want this image to also be able to run ArcPy? So that's up to you as a, as a check here. I'm going, to say, I'm going to leave that as no. And I'm going to pass in that image ID, okay? Now, a lot of this other information you can leave blank for right now. Um, you don't have to worry about it too much. Um, you know, you can, um, if some of this stuff isn't provided, it will use defaults, but we'll go ahead and say, let's do four for the memory to match. Shared, max, some of this other stuff can be left, um, left alone for now. And of course, I quickly created a new Docker runtime. All right, so what does that mean? That means now that once I have a custom runtime, I can come to my content and say, hey, I want to create a new notebook. Let's just say it's blank and give it a test, you know, dev, summit, whatever. Get it a tag, very good tag, by the way. And this allows you to now choose a existing notebook runtime, uh, ones that Esri has shipped, or one of the standard one or the custom ones that you just created that you've registered. So I'm going to use this one that I've created before. And now this is gonna launch a new notebook with that custom runtime that then I should be able to use this thing called yellow brick, okay? So if, you, if I tried to do the following in one of the other ones before, uh, it would give me an error that says, hey, I don't know what this from yellow bricks thing is all about. But I'm just gonna run this guy to show that 
this runtime, this Conda package is indeed installed in this notebook now, and um, you can import it and visualize it. For some reason, the first time you run it, it doesn't want to display the matplotlib just right. I, mean, I have to run it twice. But now, so I have a new runtime. I added some Conda packages in it, to it, and now made it available via the notebook server as a, as a new runtime. So that's cool, right? Very cool. Um, some of you that are familiar with um, Jupyter Notebooks know that you can also do conda installs using magic commands. Um, you know, that's always an option, but in those situations, um, it's something that has to be run every time the notebook is run. So this is a custom run times or a situation where you want to create something that, you know, you install the conda packages and it's going to be used by a wide range of people so they don't have to, you know, run conda commands within their notebook each time. Um, so just to wrap up briefly, I know we're probably pushing an hour. I'm not sure <laughs> when we started. Um, so one other thing I want to talk about that's exciting is the ability to execute notebooks. So quickly, I'm going to show you that I have two really sophisticated notebooks. One is called mm, Execute Notebook One. Ooh, that sounds fancy. And I'm just going to look at a preview of it. This is what the notebook looked like. It's really sophisticated notebook. You like that? <laughs> oh, yes. So that's Execute Notebook 1. And then I have another notebook called Execute Notebook 2. That is equally as sophisticated. Ooh, I don't know. I like this one even more. <laughs> so let's assume these are cool notebooks that have um, I've set it up. My intent is to be able to be able to run all cells with no user interaction. So you got to do some effort to make sure your notebook is set up that way. And then it's like, well, now we want to use this execute notebook API to be able to call these things automatically whenever I want. So separately, I'm going to jump into my Python IDE, which is a PyCharm. And here, I'm just going to quickly do something that's very, very cool. I'm first going to make a connection using the Python API to my, um, my portal. I then am going to get a list of servers. Basically, I need to find if there's a notebook server registered with my uh, portal, which there is. And then I'm, what I do is I find my execute notebook one notebook item, and then I can execute it automatically. So I'm going to call the execute notebook API on notebook server to go run this thing. And basically, you pass it the item, it runs, and then, and then what I do is when that job is completed, I wait for it, and then I run execute notebook two. All right, so I go find it and basically do the exact same thing. So I'm now going to run this just to prove you to you that it does run. So this is a very powerful new capability that allows you to run notebooks. In this case, sequentially, you could run multiples at once by submitting jobs, but perhaps one notebook is producing output that the next one needs. This is a really cool feature that allows you to start to chain or serialize notebooks um, that perform certain functions. This Python script, I could then like wire it up to Windows Task Scheduler. So this could run on a schedule, or if I really you know, wanted to do this with a cron job, I could have a shell script that does, you know, runs this Python code. Um, so that's really cool. So now you have the ability to execute notebooks fully without opening it. Um, from, you know, some API, you know, like the Python API. That's very cool, right, Shannon? You buying that? It is. It's one of the big things that a lot of data scientists said they didn't like about Jupyter was, and just regular open source Jupyter, is right. they have to interact with it every time. They want to just right. be able to run through things. And now it's frictionless. It's yep. easy. So the, the next question in everyone's mind is, Wow, it would be really great if we could just schedule this, right? Ooh, so that would be great. Portal had the ability to <laughs> schedule it, and I don't want to have to deal with Windows Task Manager and all that kind of stuff. Well, if you watched any of our plenary demos, you might have seen a hint of this or a demo or two. So this is a, a look ahead um, of what we're doing for 1081, and that is the ability to schedule notebooks. So I'm switching portals on you. Um, but this is where we have uh, some of this prototype code. So for a particular notebook, um, so here's a notebook that does data ingest and outlier detection. Um, I have a new thing here called tasks. And with a notebook, I can create a schedule. We call them tasks. 
and a notebook can be schedule can be set up to run on different schedules with different sets of parameters. So you might have noticed over here that I showed you a execute notebook. You see this parameters thing right here? So that's actually being injected from my Python code. So this is how parameters can be injected. So if you know a particular parameter is going to be injected, I could then write Python code down here that relies on this variable b. All right, well, you can, we're, we're coding for the same thing here where you can create a new task, give it a name, whatever it may be, and then pass in parameters that get passed every time that notebook is called. Um, so I'm not going to do that. And then we'll be able to set it up where you can say, hey, I want this to start right away, right now. I want it to repeat every so often. Let's just say you want it to repeat once a day um, for the next you know, 30 days or something like that. All right, so we can create tasks that then become active and they'll run its course. Um, for any existing notebooks, you can look at their, their runs. And this is a really bad example because I'm showing you a bunch of runs that failed. That's because um, this is a situation where if your notebook isn't set up to run automatically, such as a cell fails for some reason or it has user input in it, um, like running that headless will fail. Like uh, the, the, the technology that's using to run it automatically will say, hey, something happened here and the, the execution of this notebook failed. So that's just a very small uh, sneak preview um, at what we're working on for 1081. So you'll be ha we have the ability to execute notebook. Now we're going to have the ability for you to schedule the automatic execution of notebooks um, you know, on, some, on some schedule. So I guess that's all I had to run through. I know we're, we're getting close on time, so I'll turn it back to you, Shannon, to wrap things up. All right, sounds good. All right, so let's wrap up on a little bit of what's next. So in the near term, you can expect more samples and tools to be added. Um, scheduling, so that's what Bill just showed you. That is on its way. Notebooks and online, the public beta will begin on March 24th. So for some folks, they've participated in our private beta, but this will open up to every ArcGIS Online organization to try out. You can find more information on the ArcGIS Notebooks beta GeoNet community. And in the longer, mid to long term, um, model ops and uh, being able to have greater insight into your notebooks is something really important to us. So things like versioning, um, integration with ArcGIS Monitor, and even the ability to create your notebooks and save them as web tools so they can be embedded into ArcGIS applications are all things that we are working on. And there will be even more to come. But that's it. Thank you so much for joining us today. We hope you enjoy your virtual Dev Summit and check out lots and lots of sessions because now you can almost binge watch them. It's like instead of Netflix, you get Esri Dev Summit. Enjoy. Enjoy. Thanks, everyone. Appreciate it.